Um, welcome to part three of our interview series, The Roots of Violence. This week, we are once again back with Imad Kiai, director of the Middle East Treaty Organization, looking for the roots of violence in the Middle East region. The first two parts of our series took us to Iran in 1952, when US and British secret services organized the overthrow of the Iranian government in order to install their puppet king, who was himself overthrown in 1979. U.S.-Iran relations have been affected ever since then, um, yet during the 90s, Iraq became the primary concern for the USA, and eventually after the 9-11 attacks, which had nothing to do with Iraq or Iran, the USA went to war against Afghanistan and then turned attention back to Saddam Hussein, which led to his death and a change of government. Ironically, both the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have led to governments which are much more favorable to Iran than their predecessors. The U.S. has effectively built up Iran's regional influence instead of undermining it. Emad, welcome back to uh, The Roots of Violence. Um, let's kick off with, with a question which picks up from, from where we were last time. In, in 2001, the USA started the terrifying war on terror that took out the governments in Iraq and Afghanistan, as I said. President Bush included Iran in an alleged axis of evil, including uh, uh, North Korea, and noises started to be heard about an Iranian nuclear program. So to start off with, can you tell us about the uh, Iranian nuclear program? Why did it start? What was the thinking behind it? How far it developed? And, and what was the reaction of the rest of the world? Thank you, Tony, for having me back. Um, so we are, we are starting off in early 2003. Let's remember that at this point, as you have mentioned, there is a war going on with the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And the reason why uh, President Bush managed to uh, bring the U.S. into Iraq was primarily on a big lie. But then it was used as a excuse to enter into war with Saddam Hussein, and that was over its weapons of mass destruction. So here we see the uh, uh, issue of non-proliferation and WMDs coming to the fore. And when the United States, even against the United Nations Security Council decisions to enter into that war in Iraq, it led to uh, using the issue of WMDs uh, on another case. In this one, it was Iran. And in early 2003, we hear that there is some concerns over Iran's nuclear program again. And at this point, Iran has managed to do something quite remarkable. It has managed to enrich uranium. Now, the enrichment of uranium allowed Iran to enter into a club of nations where they have the technology and the know-how to take uranium ore as a naturally occurring element and be able to then enrich it for energy purposes, for other industries, and by extension, and possibly a military dimension to this form of enrichment at much higher levels. But they managed to start and break the seal of being able to enrich uranium. This uh, caused a lot of alarm on the global international scene, and it brought Iran's nuclear program once again under a spotlight. At that point, Iran, uh, again, under its rights, at the, uh, as a, a, a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and a signator to that treaty, and the IAEA, which is the nuclear watchdog of the United Nations, Iran was allowed to enrich. But it caused an issue that possibly this could become a proliferation risk. And the United States and other countries elevated the issue of Iran's nuclear program and it reached a boiling point where in the nuclear watchdog of the UN made Iran's file and uh, brought onto the, their governing board and they decided Iran is in, was in violation of its um, agreements with the International Nuclear Watchdog. And this is what is known as, I will not go into detail with it, but it was about a possibly possible military dimension 
to its nuclear program. That basically means that there are some technologies that Iran is pursuing that can be used both for civilian purposes, but also diverted possibly to a militarized uh, covert program. And at that point, it was, again, Iran had to prove to the international community that it did not want nor seeking nuclear weapons. And it started negotiations in 2003 with what is known as the EU3, three European powers, the UK, France, and Germany. And those negotiations actually, surprisingly, we will touch on what happens later on on Iran's nuclear program. But by 2005, the European powers and Iran had reached a deal that limited Iran's nuclear program to a handful of centrifuges, put Iran's nuclear um, installations and facilities into one or two sites, and everything under supervision and monitoring. But guess what? They took that to Washington, the Europeans, and President Bush, still high on its war in Iraq and toppling Saddam Hussein and eager to take its military might in the region and extend the war beyond Afghanistan and Iraq and finish off Iran was against this diplomatic rapprochement and agreement between the Europeans and Iran and that negotiations in 2005 known as the Paris Agreement failed. So give us a little bit more, more context for Iran's nuclear program, because um, back in 2003, um, in the region, uh, Iran wasn't the only country with, with a nuclear program. Who else is, is experimenting with, with nuclear energy, nu nuclear power, and, and, and how does this relate to the international uh, treaties, the NPT, and the relationship with the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency? Because, so because I will there's, something there, there's something there which is Iran is being, being made out as an exception to what else is going on in the region. I think the best way to... Um, let's quickly have an overview. Uh -huh. In the Middle East, all the countries in the Middle East, which are 22 Arab countries plus Iran and Israel, these are 24 countries we're worried about when it comes to a WMD-free zone in the Middle East. So let's geographically bring it to that area. Uh -huh. Among these 24 countries, all of them, with the exception of Israel, are signatories to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that is one of the most important treaties that has been negotiated on a global scale that limits the proliferation and spread of nuclear weapons in a grand bargain that provides, you know, um, governments and countries with the peaceful use of nuclear technology as long as they promise not to build nuclear weapons. And the countries that originally had the nuclear weapons promised to disarm and get rid of theirs. Now, that was a long time ago. It was 1970 when this uh, treaty came into existence and was signed on by all these countries. But in the Middle East, Israel didn't sign it. And Israel continued to have a covert nuclear weapons program that was masterminded and supported by Western countries. And the United States turned a blind eye to it. Why? Again, this goes to the notion of who is my friend and who's my ally and who's my enemy. So in the case of the Israeli nuclear weapons program, we know now through the Freedom of Information Act and whistleblowers and scientists and uh, satellite imagery of the advanced nuclear weapons program that Israel's got, that everybody knows is the worst kept open secret. And the French assisted in the, uh, in the construction of a plutonium reprocessing plant for the Israeli government to be able to manufacture a plutonium track to a nuclear weapon. Because just quickly, there's two really quick ways to build nuclear weapons. One is enriching uranium at high levels, and one is plutonium, which is the waste byproduct 
of when nuclear fuel burns, okay, in a power plant. Uh -huh. So when you have that waste, in that waste there's plutonium. And when you extract the plutonium, when you take it out of the waste, it's already weapons grade. You're ready. Uh -huh. So the Israelis have taken that route to build their nuclear weapons, whereas in the case of Iran's nuclear program, even though it doesn't have nuclear weapons, it has pursued an advancement in enrichment. These are two different ways. Now, when it comes to Israel's nuclear weapons program, because there are no inspectors, there is no internationally binding treaty that Israeli government has to abide by, there is no way to control what is happening on Israeli soil. We do not have cameras, we do not have inspectors, we do not know what is going on in the nuclear facilities such as Dimona in the Negev desert. What we do know through, again, these other means of getting the information is that Israel possesses somewhere between 80 and 140 nuclear warheads that have been advanced through a plutonium track and are ready and armed. And because Israel has a sophisticated, advanced, conventional weapons and uh, weapon systems, is able to have both nuclear warheads on fighter planes, in submarines, and in ballistic missiles. So this is the only case in the Middle East. When it comes to Iran, the reason why Iran's nuclear program is always elevated, and you keep hearing it in the news, is because on the point of the nuclear file, Iran is being under enormous international pressure, and it is on these specific issue of nuclear file that is allowed world powers to inflict their own coercive policies and actions on the state of Iran. And Iran has to prove that it's not guilty, that its nuclear program is peaceful, and it's again rooted in the animosity and misunderstanding and mistrust in the relationship between Iran and the sole superpower on the planet, which is the United States. And the difference between Israel's nuclear program and Iran's nuclear program is primarily based on the fact that Israel is an ally of the US and the Western powers. Number two, they have allowed it to progress towards weaponization without any retaliation, any type of sanctions, any form of inspections, and any form of pressure to stop. And number three, it is important to note that Israel, because of its historical links to Europe and the European and American special relationship with Israel, we see that it has allowed the country, Israel, to continue having this policy of opacity which means that they, know, they, they do not confirm nor deny having nuclear weapons, even though everybody knows they have it. And they've gone even beyond that, what is known as the Begin Doctrine, and have bombed other nuclear or advanced programs in the region, such as the Osirak reactor in Iraq, and also another reactor in Syria. So what the Israeli government has done has not only built up nuclear warheads and a nuclear uh, uh, um, uh, nuclear energy sector outside international inspections and monitoring it has gone out of its way to destroy through sabotage assassinations and bombing of other countries nuclear facilities and the iran latest uh, accusations against israel and the alleged attacks by israeli agents of iran's uh, facilities known as the Natanz uh, nuclear facility of Iran, where, uh, again, it was sabotaged for a number of times now for the past uh, few years. And so we see um, quite a, a shadow war happening in the region in terms of uh, what is happening on this front that has mm -hmm. been played out both on a conventional level and also, unfortunately, dealing with weapons of mass destruction or the possibility of building them. So back 
back in 2005, you you explained that the Europeans managed to do a deal with with uh, with Iran, which would uh, put restrictions, put limitations on how far they would develop their nuclear program. And yet, um, the the Iran nuclear deal, the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, um, didn't get signed until I think it was 2016, 2015. 2015, um, a decade what, later. What went on in those 10 years? Why, oh. why, why couldn't there be an agreement uh, signed earlier? Okay, I'm going to run through this really fast. Please stop me if I get too far. Um, 2005, Paris Agreement goes to Washington. President Bush says, we already got Saddam down. We got the Taliban out. The Ayatollahs are next. So there was no agreement from the Americans for the Europeans to come back to the Iranians and say, we have a deal. So that deal crumbled. And with it, the reformist uh, president, Khatami, who had put a lot of political capital in ensuring that Iran's nuclear programs as an issue will be taken to the side. And unfortunately, because of that failure, we have elections in Iran, and instead of another reformist, moderate government coming into power, we have Mahmoud Ahmadinejad being elected as the president of Iran on the rallying cry and slogans that uh, uh, he would bring dignity to the Iranians and would tear the, uh, uh, this type of um, pressure that the international community is inflicting on Iran, and why should Iran even allow these inspections and allow this type of uh, concessions when it doesn't have nuclear weapons? So, Khatami, the reformist, is out, and the failure to reach a nuclear agreement with the global community, specifically the Europeans, became a political suicide for the reformists and gave cannon fodder and much more power to the conservatives within Iran, such as Ahmadinejad, and we have a new president in Iran. And for the next eight years, oof, it's a different type of but, politics in Iran. But hang on, uh, hang on, because um, because you've made an allegation which is really is really quite serious. Uh, you've you've said that. Um, the United States are, would prefer to have a, an all-out war against Iran, a regime-changing war uh, against, um, against the rulers in, in Tehran, rather than negotiate uh, and have a deal with, with another country treating them like, like peers. Is that, is that really the, what, what we're saying? What I'm saying is, no, no, let me, let me clarify. What I'm saying is that when the 2005 nuclear agreement between European powers and Iran were agreed, that piece of paper had to be signed off by Washington. Again, why? Because the United States has enormous amount of influence over its European partners too. So the Europeans went to Washington and said, listen, we have agreed. With the Iranians, they will limit their nuclear facilities, their nuclear uh, activities. We will have inspections, monitoring. And if you look at that piece of agreement that was taken to Washington, you will see that it has a lot of similarities later on with the interim deal that was signed that eventually became more comprehensive and known as the JCPOA. But at that point, President Bush and those around him, the Dick Cheney's, the, those who were pro-hawkish, warmongers in Washington had seen the collapse of the Taliban and Saddam Hussein. And conveniently, hundreds of thousands of US military personnel and equipment was surrounding Iran. And if you look back at the rhetoric and the actions of the United States uh, during the Bush presidency, you will see that they had Iran on their crosshairs, that they were targeting Iran somehow. Maybe they wouldn't openly say regime change, but look at their actions, look at their policies. And it's showcased that there's a possibility that there will be another war in the Middle East, and that one would have been Iran. And so here, there's a lot of changes that occurs because it's sort of like the presidency in Washington believed that diplomacy was not, a, it was not time for diplomacy. 
that we had, look, Saddam is done. We did it outside of the UN. We have carte blanche after 9-11 to do what we want. So why not? There's a possibility we can go into Iran. So there was no appetite in Washington for diplomacy. It didn't work when the United Nations Security Council overwhelmingly was against the US going into Iraq and they created their own coalition of the willing that they uh, co-opted the British uh, under uh, uh, Tony Blair to also drink the Kool-Aid and go into Iraq uh, and cause a devastating war that cost thousands of lives on the back of a big lie. So that we know today. Uh -huh. So putting it in context in 2005, this is before uh, this instability of Iraq and Afghanistan reaches a point where US is struggling to keep it even intact. But mm -hmm. those fast, furious initial wave of invasion that collapsed the regimes uh, gave those in Washington which were pro-war and hawkish ammunition and uh, precedence that it is possible to make swift victories at the countries that we consider uh, enemies. So Iran was definitely a target. Uh, I wouldn't say that it was uh, implemented because it hasn't been, but it definitely mm -hmm. was considered. So what, what happened then, or what happened in international politics, which took that, that regime change war off the agenda? I think a few things happened. So the Europeans were very eager to make a, new, uh, make a diplomatic agreement because they were worried that the Americans would use the issue of WMDs and Iran's nuclear file to enter into another war. Number two, when there was an agreement and the US uh, said no, you had also a quick change in government in Iran because it was near the elections. And with Ahmadinejad in power, it caused a completely different uh, reality uh, that has that occurred on a national level within Iran. Iranian politics changed to become more aggressive. It was like Bush being aggressive and Iranian presidents like, okay, fine, you want a war? We want a war too. Come for it. And let's, uh, it, it, it put up the ante. The pressures were reaching boiling point. And Iranian Ahmadinejad's presidency was uh, characterized by populist uh, slogans, by Iran moving away from international cooperation and expanding its nuclear program. And then here, something else also occurred on a regional level. Both Afghanistan and Iraq were, uh, because of the animosity between Iran and the US, that initially there was a level of cooperation that assisted the US, as we talked about in a previous discussion, in bringing an end to the Taliban and Saddam Hussein because of the form of language and politics of Washington and again in Iran under Ahmadinejad, the tables turned. Iran said, okay, we can't do this through a, a constructive dialogue and diplomacy. We are going to make it extremely difficult for the United States to maintain its foothold and presence in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And there was an enormous amount of Iranian support to militia groups and to others within Iraq and Afghanistan to then create the uh, conditions in which United States found itself extremely troubled. What do I mean? Indirectly supporting groups that would target American military installations and personnel. That would create um, a lot of havoc within the inside the country for the Americans to have any stability. An American own policy in post Saddam Hussein uh, collapse also uh, accelerated this because the United States also did not know very well how to operate in, this, uh, in these uh, two theaters of war, Afghanistan and Iraq, by disbanding thousands and tens of thousands of Iraqi soldiers and military personnel that were then absorbed by different uh, factions that created turmoil on uh, some on the part of civil war within Iraq. And here, United States got entangled and uh, 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 stuck in Afghanistan and in Iraq to such an extent 
that any adventurous expansionist ideas of an invasion or an attack on Iran subsided very quickly. This became an unpopular war uh, in the United States and the United States government found itself extremely in a, a negative position when these uh, body bags were coming back to the United States. So the war started to cost a lot in Afghanistan and Iraq and Iranian Ahmadinejad presidency brings up the ante and brings the temperature up. There is disagreement on the international arena. And at this point, the United Security Council and other world powers, having seen Washington uh, not agree to this uh, European initiative with the Iranians, realize that they need to really band together or the US is just going to think that it's in a wild, wild west and it's just gonna do as it wishes. So there was a, a concerted, united effort on the global scene to rein in this uh, unchecked power of the United States. And here is when Iran's nuclear file and how it is addressed between 2005, the presidency of Ahmadinejad until 2013, when he is out of his presidency and the election and presidency of Obama creates a new era on international politics. With Obama coming into the reins in Washington, we are finished with the years of the Bush um, uh, warmongers and hawks in Washington. And there was a replacement, at least on paper, of someone who advocated for international cooperation, multilateralism, and diplomacy. So Iran's nuclear program goes through this three phases. One is uh -huh. before Ahmadinejad, this agreement with the Europeans that was shot down by the Americans. Between 2005 to 2013, we have Ahmadinejad in power, expanding Iran's nuclear program, making it extremely difficult to cooperate with the international community. You will have the US entangled in these wars. It has to then re uh, emerge itself on the international arena and forget about what is done through the Bush era with the election of President Obama. And here from 2009 to 2013 is a new page where the US is again seen as cooperating within the UN and multilateralism. And this coincides with Iran again expanding its nuclear program and the United Nations Security Council unleashing its most comprehensive sanctions then on Iran through the efforts of the Obama administration and Secretary of State then Hillary Clinton in creating a global, global unity in terms of inflicting these sanctions on Iran. It, they were able to create truly one of the most comprehensive coalitions of the willing then under the back of uh, uh, inflicting sanctions and other policies wow. short of a war with Iran. So here we have a change of tune in Washington, a change of tune in Tehran, and so these worlds are colliding. So then did, did, the, did the US, the, uh, the Obama administration policy of um, sanctions, did that do anything positive? Was that, did that help encourage Iran to come to the negotiating table? What was it that, that brought Iran back ready to, to negotiate? You, there's, there's a change in, in leadership, obviously, but still, you know, there's still a lot of a hard line in Iran. What was happening in Iran? Tony, sanctions on a global level, on a regional level, on a national level, inflict harm on the people and not their governments. It inflicts pain, economic pain, social pain, and it dwarfs efforts of any progress on socioeconomic political fronts. And unfortunately, those years of comprehensive sanctions that continue to today have only held back the Iranian people and unfortunately have rallied the population around the flag and have strengthened the central government and its own 
uh, sort of prism through which it sees the world. And that is one that it is uh, fighting against, you know, global powers that do not want it to survive. So unfortunately, what we are seeing is that those years of sanctions did not help diplomacy. Actually, it not only hurt the Iranian public, it expanded Iran's nuclear program. In 2005, Iran had a hundred and odd centrifuges spinning. By 2013, when negotiations started again within the United Nations Security Council, Iran had over 20,000 centrifuges spinning. And this is the reason why you cannot force a government, a country such as Iran, with sanctions and forcing it, twisting its arm for it to come to the negotiating table. So instead of actually Iran contracting its nuclear program, it expanded. Instead of Iran becoming more socially open, it closed in. In terms of Iran becoming even more progressive, it, no, it became even more conservative. And so it had all the reversal, all the aims of sanctions that were not achieved. But um, something changed in Washington. President Obama selected a new Secretary of State. And this Secretary of State came into power, replaced Hillary Clinton, and we have a new team in Washington, and there's an election in Iran where Ahmadinejad is out, and Rouhani, President Rouhani, who's the outgoing president now, comes into power with his foreign minister, Javad Zarif. Who was the foreign minister in the States? John Kerry. Okay. Now, the stars align. 2013, Ahmadinejad is out. The sanctions are in. Iran's nuclear program has expanded. We have a new team in Tehran that is eager to re-engage with the international community. And guess what? The team that I'm talking about, Rouhani, Zarif, and others who made up this new administration were the same ones who negotiated the 2005 agreement with the Europeans. So they knew exactly on a nuclear front, what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. On the other side, in Washington, we have Hillary Clinton is being replaced by John Kerry, and John Kerry's understanding of what needs to be done makes a switch in Obama's policy towards Iran, where Obama, until that point, had maintained the Bush-era mantra of zero enrichment in Iran, and Iran said, you cannot tell us not to have enrichment. It's all right. And here, John Kerry and his team with Obama reached a compromise where they changed a simple language from zero enrichment to limited enrichment. This slight change of language and a new team in Washington and Tehran opened the door for the Iranians to enter into negotiations at the United Nations Security Council in New York in 2013 and start in earnest a diplomatic multilateral approach to resolving this issue after a decade, after a decade of back and forth sanctions assassinations, sabotage, and close encounters that could have erupted in an all-out war, we finally, there was political will from key capitals to invest in diplomacy. And here is the key. Without political will, without investing the time, the resources, and what is necessary, the compromise, the negotiations, these type of mechanisms will not work. And here, by within two short years, when you look at the whole thing, two years seems short. Within two years, Iran and world powers, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, Russia, China, UK, France, United States, plus Germany, and the European Union agreed in 2015 to a nuclear deal known as the 
Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or the JCPOA. And what, what was in the JCPOA? What, what did Iran agree to with the JCPOA? Why is it, why is it good? And why would Trump come along and withdraw from it? All right. Let's try to keep this quite simple. Five things Iran did and in return got two things. Okay? Imagine a basket of compromise agreement. Iran agreed to limit its enrichment level to low enriched uranium. So 3.5% or 5%. This allows Iran to have enrichment, but at a low level that it does not then go towards weaponization. So Iran limited its level of enrichment. Number two, it limited the number of its centrifuges. Because remember, Iran had 20,000 at that point, and Iran agreed to bring it down to 5,000. So it spins much less numbers of centrifuges. Number three, Iran agreed to not uh, install sophisticated new generations of centrifuges that like, spin faster and can enrich faster. So Iran limited its expansion of more sophisticated centrifuges. Number four, Iran, when it came to its research and development, was limited to a small number uh, of um, uh, where it has a, 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 um, allowances or bandwidth to uh, do its research and it would be all within one facility. And number five, Iran agreed to convert its heavy water reactor, which posed a threat in proliferation in the future through a reprocessing that could result in plutonium. We talked about it a little bit earlier, that there's a plutonium track to nuclear weapons. So Iran agreed to convert that heavy water reactor to a light water reactor, which would then avoid the need for reprocessing and by eventuality allow for no need for uh, a possibility of a plutonium track to a nuclear warhead. These are the five things. And um, just to let you know, it also, I, I just uh, want you to know that like, by extension, it also includes the fact that Iran had stockpiles of these enriched uranium and those were like really high level, beyond 20% is called highly enriched uranium. Iran agreed to limit it and also dilute it so it becomes low enriched uranium. And others were exported out of the country. So just to let you know that all of these things were the practical things that Iran had to do, limit uh -huh. what it does. In addition to that, Iran also agreed to the most intrusive inspections that the IAEA could do in the country. Iran agreed to an enormous amount of monitoring and new technologies were developed to ensure that Iran's nuclear program from its mining to bringing it to these facilities 24-7 is under the watch of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So Iran made all of these concessions that went beyond it's uh, what it has under the agreement of the NPT. It didn't have to do this. So Iran is the only country in the world, as we speak, that has allowed this level of concessions on its nuclear program and this level of inspections and this level of monitoring. There is no other country. So then why didn't Donald Trump like this very much? I'm going to get to that in two seconds. because. Iran agreed to this, not for free. Iran agreed to this for one specific major change. For United Nations Security Council sanctions to be removed, the European Union sanctions to be removed, and the United States sanctions on Iran's nuclear program or related to Iran's nuclear program to be removed. And Iran's nuclear file to be normalized, and Iran could open up its uh, market and its people and its country and become again a fully fledged member of the international community and operate like a normal country. All right? So that was the deal. 2015. They make this agreement. 
And until 2018, when President Trump pulls out of the deal, the agreement was working. The inspectors were there. The monitoring system was working. The IAEA report on Iran's nuclear program showed that Iran is doing exactly what it's promised to do. And we can verify it. Then President Trump comes in. He gets elected. And in his own slogans and election campaigning, he said, this was a bad deal. This was a terrible deal. United States made concessions to Iran. And uh, if I become president, I'm going to tear it up. And unfortunately, when he became president, he did. Now, why? Was it because the nuclear deal with Iran stopped Iran from building nuclear weapons? Did the deal allow for, uh, uh, allow for that aim to be achieved? Yes, Iran, we know, was not building a nuclear weapon. So why then, if there's concern over Iran's nuclear program, Trump tore and got out of the Iran nuclear deal? That answer lays in its support that was received to his administration from the likes of the military industrial complex in Washington, the lobbying groups there, and those who represent countries such as Israel, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates, who saw the Iranian nuclear deal as, again, a direct threat to their regional and uh, global relationships and the dynamics that are happening in the region, primarily with what they thought that if the nuclear deal progresses further, it will normalize Iran and U.S. relationship. And here, it will be at the cost to their regional uh, influence and what they see as their key backer of security, the United States, in being the protector of their interest in the region. So here, the dynamics change. It's not about the President Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal primarily for the fact that, number one, it had made a promise, a slogan promise, and he thought that he can have a better deal. So he wanted to dismantle everything that Obama had done, may that be the Paris climate change, climate agreements to other agreements that Obama had done. He just wanted to dismantle it. Number two, he had received a lot of um, pressure from uh, the Netanyahu government in Israel and others uh, such as Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates that, they, that this deal does not serve the national interests of the United States nor its allies in the region because it gives Iran a free ride in terms of its hegemonic power and aims in the region. So, and then finally, it was primarily driven by the fact that there is this level of animosity and there's this level of mistrust between the United States and Iran that unfortunately, when it is left to outsiders to um, navigate and maneuver the US in how it applies its policies in the Middle East, unfortunately, it is lost because there's no direct relations between these two capitals, Tehran and Washington. So unfortunately, Iranian nuclear deal became um, a casualty in this uh, presidency of Trump. Very good. Um, I think we're going to leave it there. We've covered a lot of ground today. Thank you, Emad. Um, it's really interesting to see how all the pieces of this puzzle are, are fitting together and bringing us up to uh, the situation where we're in today, where the, 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 the powers are in Vienna as we speak, uh, talking about how to how to rescue the, the Iran nuclear deal, how to bring the United States back into compliance with it and, uh, and Iran back to fulfilling all of the commitments that it agreed to. Um, I think next time we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up from there and we'll see what else is going on in the, in the region and, uh, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about Israel. So 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us and listening again to this really interesting series. And uh, we'll pick it up next time.